Hello and welcome back to this installment of the Tiger Create tutorial series. In this part we want to have a look at the animation stuff. How do we animate things? How do we make things move? For this we open up Tiger Create and look at the scene we already prepared. We have one scene here with four objects installed. This ice float, the father diving, little polar bear and a mask for the father. And we have a text box in here. Now we look at the scene again. You see this frame here. This frame defines which part of the scene is shown on devices that are not 4 by 3 as the iPad is or old television TVs. Modern devices are often 16 by 9 like the iPhone 5 and this means that some content is cut from the top or from the bottom and you can define this for each scene by dragging this frame around. We now have to look at another setting for the book it's the frames per second frames per second fps value this one it's set to 20 frames per second right now this means that every second is split into 20 equal parts this will be important when we start to animate things and for the animation we pick the ice float because it should go a bit to the right this is a good chance to tell you about the set order. Each object has a set order that shows where it is in the list of things. Is it on top of another object or is it behind another object? The lower the value, the more behind it is. This one is zero set order. Then we set the father to set order one. Now the father is in front of the ice float. When we set the ice float to a higher set order than the father, you see, set order 5, for example, it's a higher value, it is on top of the father. So we set it just back to zero. Now it's behind again. And Lars here, we can give it a set value of 10. And now Lars is above the ice float and above the father. The real number is not important, it's just important how high the number is in relation to the other objects. Now let's look at the ice float here and put it to the left. I scale it up a bit to make it bigger. Scale with 1.2, scale height 1.2 so we can better watch it. And this ice float here, when I click it, shows some properties in the timeline. This one here is the timeline and this one is the scrubber. It will be used later on when we animate the object. And now we want to set keys. To set a key means that we remember the position and rotation and scale and opacity values at a certain position. To set keyframes we have to click the record button here. I click it and I just want to remember this position. So I click here in the first frame in the position value. Now the system remembers this position here. When I now move to frame 20 and set another keyframe it means that this object here has the same position for one second. It's one second because we have 20 frames per second. These are the frames. We have 20, so this means one second. The object goes in one second from this position to this position. You don't see any movement because the position is still the same, but if you go here to the key you remembered, and you change the position, all the values in between will be interpolated. So we remembered the starting position and we changed a new ending position 
and that's it. When we look at it using the toggle edit preview key command P, you see the ice float goes from the left to the right and then goes back to the beginning. I toggle back using the shortcut and look at the animation values here, animation properties. Repetitions is set to zero. Zero means endless. So when I set it to one and look at the preview mode again, you see the animation starts and goes once. The ice float goes once to the right. This is what the preview mode is for, for a fast check. If you now want to make it go back and forth, we would need to set the next frame here, for example, in frame 40. So when I set the key, it remembers the actual position. So the position is not changed. So nothing happens between frame 20 and 40. And then in frame 40, we go back this way. So now it goes back and forth. But you see it's not exact. So to have an exact repeating movement, you have to set the repetitions to zero again. Watch it. And it jumps a little bit. So you have to copy the values from the start here to the end. The values are 293 by 365. 293 by 365. And if you now watch the preview, it goes back and forth without jumping. You have to play with this a lot to get the hang of it, but it's, there's a chance to make it much easier. So I go with a right mouse click to the keys and say delete all position keys and we start from the beginning. I say we record this position as the start frame in frame 1. And now we get to frame 40 and remember this as the ending position. You know. It starts here and it ends here. And now I just make another key here at frame 20 and drag the ice float wherever I want to have it. And now if you watch it in the preview mode, you see it goes back and forth without a problem. This is essential to learn that you can copy positions to other keyframes. So if you want to have this position here copied, just move it this way. The scrubber here is at frame 20 and now you go to for example frame 60. So the same position you have here in frame 20 is now copied to frame 60. So if I scrub around here you see it goes to the same frame. And now I want to go back to the ending again here and I copy this to frame 80. And if you scrub it, just click here in the number bar and drag the slider around. You see it goes back and forth as it should. So now it goes twice to the right and does this lots of times. I change this to repetitions 1 and watch it again with the preview mode. It goes to the right, back, to the right, and back again. That's what we wanted to see. Now I click it, and now we want to change the second position. First to the right, back, and again to the right. Now if you just go there and use another position, you see it goes to the right, goes back, and now goes a little bit down and right, and back again. Look at it in the preview mode, and you see how it works. You can delete 
the keys here you will write mouse click cut and cut this one and you see always the last key in one row will be marked so you always see where the animation ends so all this you did by setting and removing keys when the record button is set because this means that you change key values for example here you want to go all the way to the right or even out of the screen and back again look at it it goes to the right and back again so you modify these values if you now choose the ice float and you un click the record button. You now can move the complete animation around. You, for example, you see, uh, now it would be much better if the complete animation would start here. And then, watch it, the complete animation was moved. Because you do not change key values anymore, you now can drag the full animation around. This is quite important. For example, you can copy and paste this object and it's now a new object. You see screen 03 eyes and this new object screen 03 eyes underscore one. But the animation was copied with the object. And when you now watch it, you have two objects moving from the left to the right. And by dragging around this one here and for example making it a bit smaller you now have two ice floats. And this one should not go as far out of the screen as it does now. So I click again the record button and then I just change this key value here at frame 20 and now look at it again, you see it just went inside the screen to the right and back again. Now I remove these objects because I want to have some space here for playing around with this. And I want to add now additional parameters like rotation and stuff. So I changed this value, the start value, goes back here and then I want to have it in this position. So now it goes in a triangle. And now when it goes a bit in the background, I want to make it smaller. So it goes in the background. So I first say, okay, we need to remember the scale at the beginning. Always start with keyframes for a new parameter like scale, rotation, opacity or position in the first frame. It will make strange things if you start this in uh, another frame instead of the first because here the um, value is not defined anymore. So let's get back here and start in frame one with the scale we have and then we go to the background here we set another key we want to have another scale now so we have to set a key and i scale it down a little bit so and the position is changed too it's here in the background and it stays and this scale value, I remember the scale back here. And then here in the foreground, I want to have the same scale as I had it in the beginning. So I just go to the beginning. These are the correct values now. And then I go to the last frame and remember the scale. And you see, it goes to the background. It gets a little bit smaller. And when it comes to the foreground again, it gets bigger again. 
because I copied the same size from frame 1. And now when I look at it, it will take 3 seconds because I'm using 20 frames per second here. I have 60 frames here, so it will use 3 seconds. And now you can add, for training purposes, some rotation. We start here in the first frame, of course, with this rotation value. And uh, we want to have the same rotation at the end. And in the middle, we want to spin it around a bit from here. And now spin it some more. And now here, go back to the normal rotation. You can set it here manually. And now we watch it. It spins around and gets back to its normal rotation value. And for tuning here, you can always look at these keys while scrubbing back and forth. And of course the opacity is important too. It's fully visible at the start and at the end and uh, we'll make it... we'll use these values too here and from here we make it invisible for a short time. I set the opacity back to zero and then it gets visible again. Let's watch it. Whoops! And was invisible for a short time. You see, when you go here, it's not fully invisible in the editor because it would make it hard to find this image again. But in the reader, in the finished book, of course it's not visible anymore. Even if it's still visible in the editor when the value is set to zero. A very nice feature is that when you are not in record mode, so the record mode is not switched on but switched off, you can mark keys and then drag them around. Okay, I start from the beginning. I just remove the ice float and drag it in back again. And uh, now I want to show the zooming feature of the timeline. Because here you can zoom in the timeline and zoom out again. And this is important if you need lots of frames. For example, if the ice float should move to the right very slowly. I go into the record mode, I get back to the first frame, and then I want to move this ice float here to the right outside of the screen here. And when I look at it, it's quite fast. So I set the repetitions to once because it should go outside the screen only once. And now I want to make this animation this way that it takes about uh, 50 seconds to go outside. So it drifts slowly away. 50 seconds times 20 frames per second is 1000 frames. So I want to increase the number of total frames in the scene to 1000. And now when you look at it, you zoom in, you see this is frame 1, this is frame 40, and this is frame 1000. And I just drag this frame over to frame 1000. And now it takes many many frames to go to the right so this will take about 50 seconds. I look at it in the preview mode. You see, the ice float drifts away slowly. But remember, when you edit, of course, because it is zoomed, here in this zoom setting, you see not every frame. You will see each key that is set, but um, when you work in here it will have some strange results so if you set frames normally and you tweak your animation you zoom back 
to the scale where you can see each single frame. And that's it for now. Thank you and goodbye.